Wow. What a, uh, so let me ask you a question. We started this morning um, talking to all of you about we made some changes to the event this year. Listening to your surveys and trying to integrate some more innovation. Always have great speakers here, but obviously wanted to make the event a little bit stronger this year. Uh, feedback so far? Positive? Yes? No? Great. You know, I don't know about you, but um, I have a number of apps on my phone right now, and uh, I, I have to tell the truth. You know, I, I have a, a gate on my house uh, at the driveway because I live in a bad neighborhood. Sorry. And um, I can tell you, my wife's like, why are you stalking me? You know? Well, I just know you're home. Can you do this with a dog and so forth? But that is real technology that's really happening today. So uh, very exciting speech, and I appreciate his time today. So, so what we've all been waiting for today is one of the hallmark events um, that we have here around the Hall of Fame. Uh, and what I'd like to do is I would like to invite uh, Jeff Kammerer from uh, PwC to the stage, who's going to do our presentation today, and thank PwC for their continued sponsorship. Jeff? So coming from the other side. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. We at PwC are proud to continue our sponsorship of the Technology Hall of Fame of Georgia Award Program. This is our 24th year that we have helped honor the extraordinary efforts of the men and women that have led the way for the development and success of the technology industry here in Georgia. Each year, an inductee is selected by the current Hall of Fame members from a slate of nominees uh, in recognition of his or her contributions uh, to the industry. I'd now like to take a moment to recognize the Hall of Fame members that are here in attendance today. So as I call your name, please stand and be recognized. And audience, please hold your applause until the, all, all candidates or all Hall of Fame members have been uh, introduced. Ken Byers, Wayne Clough, Alan Ecker, Jim Edenfield, Dennis Hayes, Don House, Charlie Mosley, Sig Mosley, Tom Noonan, Leland Strange, and Bill Todd. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for being here. And we ask at the end of the program today if you could please stick around for a group photo. Thanks. Today, we are excited and honored to recognize Jeff Sprecher, founder and CEO of Intercontinental Exchange, as this year's inductee into the Hall of Fame. Congratulations, Jeff. Uh, at this point, I'd like to turn the stage over to Tom Noonan, who will provide some introductory remarks regarding Jeff, um, followed by a uh, brief video. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's great to be here. Jeff, thank you to you and the partners that PwC for your continued support of our technology community and for uh, your leadership in uh, sponsoring this important recognition of technology leadership, the Technology Hall of Fame, Georgia Technology Hall of Fame Award. It's now my great honor and privilege to introduce the recipient of the 2017 Georgia Technology Hall of Fame Award. As I was thinking about this, uh, I thought, like many that have come before him um, and received this award in prior years, 
This year's recipient was motivated to start his business by recognizing the world as it could be uh, and asked why not. As entrepreneurs, we know the challenges and challenging the status quo takes more than just hard work. And that despite believing that there's a better way, the road to success is often long and arduous. In every field of human endeavor, those who attempt to disrupt the status quo are met with fierce denial and detraction. This year's recipient is no stranger to thinking big and disrupting the status quo. He exemplifies the entrepreneurial smarts, vision, and especially the grittiness needed for success. Jeff Sprecher, the chairman and CEO of Intercontinental Exchange, began his journey in 1996 with a single step. He purchased the Continental Power Exchange here in Atlanta for $1. Continental Power Exchange was located just across 285 on the river. Over a 20-year period, he has built a global enterprise now valued at nearly $40 billion that automates the trading Go ice. <laughs> that, that automates the trading and clearing of much of the world's equities, futures, and commodities, include, including the ownership of what I call the high temple of American capitalism, the world's largest stock exchange, the 220-year-old New York Stock Exchange, which he acquired in 2013. At its heart, ICE is a technology company a massively scalable electronic trading platform recognized today as the ecosystem of markets, clearinghouses, data, and listing services that combines to provide transparent access to global capital and derivatives markets around the world. ICE's dramatic growth has been driven by the market's increased need for efficiency, automation, and risk management. I've known this year's honoree since he came to Atlanta in 1997, and despite the rigors of building and operating a global corporation, Jeff and his wife Kelly give willingly of their time, their talent, and their resources back to this community. Jeff chairs the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. He has been very active with the Technology Association of Georgia over the years, and very supportive of my alma mater, Georgia Tech. And he and his wife, Kelly, own the Atlanta Dream, the, the women's basketball team here in Atlanta. I'm very proud to serve on his board of directors at ICE New York Stock Exchange, and even more proud today to recognize this very deserving honoree with the 2017 Georgia Technology Hall of Fame Award. We're gonna roll a video. Well, I grew up in uh, the Midwest in Wisconsin, and uh, my parents instilled sort of Midwest values in me. So I've always worked. You know, when I was young, I had a paper route, uh, by the way, which is no fun in Wisconsin in the winter. Um, and then when I became a little older, uh, I worked at a car dealership washing the cars and uh, doing odd jobs or moving the cars around a lot and those kinds of things. Um, and then I put myself through uh, college being a surveyor for the state. Well, I went to uh, get an MBA at um, Pepperdine University, which is in Malibu, California. And there I met a guy who had an idea to start a company, and, and he liked me, and he asked me if I would join him. Um, and that was to build, own, and operate power plants. So we started a company um, to do small alternative energy plants. I did that for 17 years and eventually I bought out my partner and, and was building, owning and operating large central station utility grade power plants across the country as the business evolved. And I thought there should be a national market for electric power. And I wanted there to be an exchange where uh, particularly large wholesale customers like utilities and large industrials could buy and sell power from each other. And, um, 
I just assumed uh, in the late 90s when I was thinking about this that you would use a computer. I started ICE, my current company, as a sideline venture in order to be a customer, not for any other reason. And so as I was thinking about the business, I was thinking about it as a customer. I was thinking about what do I want? What, what do I wish it would do? How do I wish it would operate? I found a small company that was failing. It was in Atlanta. And um, I sort of famously or infamously bought the company for a dollar. And by year 2000, the whole mindset of our country had changed and we were in the height of a dot-com boom and everybody wanted to use the internet. And so it was the foresight of some of my colleagues that positioned us. What I realized is that we had built a digital franchise in an analog world. And I started to look for these analog opportunities. In other words, people that were resisting change and I started acquiring legacy exchanges uh, and putting our technology platform in. So we launched the company in year 2000, and in year 2001, I bought the energy exchange in Europe, which is where the world's crude oil is priced. People thought we were mad. I mean, people just said, you're crazy. Like, you can't trade commodities on the internet. And um, we were just a little ahead of time uh, we saw the power of it. And so then, you know, ultimately, uh, today we have 11 exchanges, including the New York Stock Exchange, which is the one that's most noted. Um, and I also started to realize back in year 2001 that the post-trade business was important. Um, and uh, that's called clearing. And so today we own six clearing houses. It's a bit like eBay and PayPal. You know, we were an eBay starting exchanges, but pretty quickly we realized that PayPal, the movement of the money uh, and the way that transactions are handled uh, after they're consummated was really interesting. And so we are a dominant player now in the post-trade business, uh, which is called clearing and, uh, and run both, but rooted in that is technology. Today, about 40% of our revenues is actually coming from uh, monetizing data. So it's, it's not necessarily clicking the button, which is what it was when we started the company in year 2000. There's something about the culture of Atlanta and technology that, uh, that really works. I think it's coming into its own. Um, you know, this year I'm chairing the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce and the chamber who I've been a part of for a number of years has been doing a lot of work with some of the other organizations like TAG and, and, and some of the incubators to really identify what are the skill sets that we have here, what are the skills that are needed, and uh, we're doing a much better job of inventorying and thinking about, you know, what can the society of Atlanta and of Georgia do to help, you know, foster what we already have, and how do we nurture it, how do we grow it, and so just having that kind of thought process around uh, the culture of Georgia. Um, you know, by the business community, I think it's going to accelerate what's already a very good thing. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big hand to Jeff Sprecher, Chairman and CEO of Intercontinental Exchange. Thank you. Um, I, I'm sitting here wondering if I should retire because I don't know that it's going to get any better for me than this. Um, well, first of all, let me thank um, uh, my colleagues at PwC and, uh, and their nomination and, and selection committee um, for the honor. Uh, thanks to Tag and Larry, who, I've, uh, as Tom mentioned, I've had a long affiliation with. 
And I'm sitting over here at a table full of uh, former recipients, and it's kind of a who's who of business and technology. So I look around that table, and I'm honored to be uh, not only with them uh, for lunch, but also now on a list of people that uh, have really uh, uh, motivated me and, and, and that I admire, particularly for what they've done and given back to Georgia. Um, I've, there's a table over here of my colleagues, and I want to acknowledge them because uh, uh, we didn't invite them, and, uh, <laughs> and so I'm really honored that they heard about this and, and on their own said they wanted to be here. Um, technology is an interesting uh, business to be in because you can't do it alone, and uh, you need people to come up with ideas, and you need people then to take those ideas and write them down as requirements, and then people that can take the requirements and write code, and then people that can take the code and test it, and then people that can take the product and disseminate it and sell it, and then somebody that can give a feedback loop to, to come back and say that was a good or bad idea. So it's, it's inherently a team, and, uh, and I'm honored to, uh, to be standing with the team here who, who has built really um, the largest company in, uh, in our space by revenues over, over a period of years, and, and one that's admired in, in the work that we do. Um, and lastly, I'm, uh, Tom mentioned my wife, and uh, we have a unique relationship. For those that know me, know my wife, because uh, Kelly and I work together, and, um, and met at work, and she, was, she did our first budget, which, uh, which she nailed, by the way. And, uh, and so we have built uh, a company um, that uh, we're quite proud of, and I'm, I'm quite proud to, to uh, have her. And, and as you honor me, you're certainly honoring her. So thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. What a great story. <laughs> I'm going to sit here, I think, so I can look that way. OK. <laughs> Let's do it that way. Um, standing ovation. Yeah, that, I think that's the first. Well In fact, I'm sure that's the first. But well thank learned. You. Thank you. Well learned. Thank you all. So learned a little bit uh, uh, from you, from your speech, from the introduction. But maybe we could dive a little bit deeper in a, in sure. a few things. And especially, you know, so you think about the story. Two decades ago, you bought it for a dollar took on a little bit of debt, right. and uh, then you turned it around, grew it, over $30 billion. All right. Tell us a little bit more about that journey. How did you get it from a dollar? Well, um, first of all, you know, I stand in front of it and, and maybe was the catalyst to form it, but it really is a, is a group, and, and we just kind of hit the magic of, uh, of being the right kind of personalities um, that, that, that fought their way through. We, we, had, uh, we were not alone uh, in thinking about this at the time we started the company, but we were the one company that emerged uh, in our space. And um, uh, I, you know, to me, it's like a, a game of survivor. And, and you either cut out to play that game or you'd rather watch it on TV. And we decided we were going to play the game. But you know, for every step forward you take, you get knocked back. And you've got to get up and step forward, and then you get knocked back. And, and you've got to have the kind of group dynamics and personalities that say, OK, I'm going to get up today and, and do that again. And um, um, if you do that, if you have that attitude, and then you listen to your customers who, who give you feedback on whether or not you're, you're going in the right direction, it, it's, it all comes it all kind of foots together. And so there's no magic to it other than, other than hard work and, and paying attention to, to the people that you're serving. You said survivors, sometimes it's like king of the mountain, right? If you're at the top, somebody yeah. wants to knock you off. Yeah, we're kind of at the together. top now, and it's yeah. definitely a harder, uh, it's harder to be at the top, because every you, when you, when we all have this, I think, in, in this country, which is we really do root for the underdogs, and we really do want uh, startups, we like entrepreneurs, and we, wanna, we want them to succeed. And so, but once you become kind of big, you're the incumbent, and people say, oh, they're kind of, you know, they're, they're kind of sitting on their laurels, and maybe we should take a shot at them. So uh, I, I, we're better at coming up than we have been at staying on top. So part of, part of being on top is creating the internal motivation that there's still, we're not quite at the top of the hill yet. You know, there's still more hill. We just, we're just kind of on a little knoll. <laughs> and that's uh, part of my job is convincing everybody, you know, we got to keep marching. 
It's a nice mole. <laughs> it <laughs> pays well, you know. <laughs> so. Many people in the room have companies uh, thinking or will be thinking about going public. Mm -hmm. um, in your career, how has this progressed, and how, have, in particular, how have acquisitions helped you um, in that position? Yeah, well, um, so a little background. I, I've uh, started this company, and, and as the video mentioned, it was not the first company I started, and so I was able to start ICE using my own money, in, in which case we had no venture capital or outside investors. Um, so we had a goal to get public because we wanted to get public company capital. And so I'm very, very pro um, being a public company. I like being, I really like being a public company. And I'm not saying this because we own the New York Stock Exchange. When we went public, <laughs> um, we had a $600 million valuation. Um, and, uh, and I was in awe of being in this building, uh, honestly. And ringing the bell in the New York Stock Exchange was literally, it is one of the 10 great moments of my life. But, um, but I really believe in public markets. And, um, um, and I did even when we started this company. You know, I, and, and I'll tell you, for, for entrepreneurs here that are building companies, what the difference is to me, it's kind of like, you can, take, you can take other people's money, and I have done that, and, I've, and I started another company, as I mentioned in the video, that was very successful, and I took other people's money. But it kind of reminds me of being you know, 26 years old and living in your parents' basement. Um, the rent is cheap. Um, your mom wakes you up every day, and you can usually get her to do the laundry, and you can usually show up at around meals and get fed, and it's pretty easy. Um, and being, uh, but there's a point in life where you say, I actually want to have my own apartment, and I want to, I'll figure out the laundry, and I, you know, I, I actually want to move on to this space where I have more control over what I'm doing. And the great thing about being a public company is that, is that all those people that gave you money are gone, and you're just now serving the public. And, and you know, when, when, and, and my wife Kelly is our head of investor relations, and so uh, being married to, to that person, I, I probably tend to talk to more investors than most CEOs, because it's partly what we talk about a lot, my wife and I. And, um, you know, the investors are asking me, what are you going to do? What, what are you building? Where are you going? Where are you taking the company? You know, and, 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 and it's my management team and I are determining our future and our legacy. And I like that. Uh, and that's why I really like being public. I think you read articles all the time that, you know, you can be Uber and you can, you can continue to raise money privately. But, but I like the trade-off of being a public company um, because I like setting our own destiny. Very good. So degree, chemical engineering, studied business. Um, you worked hard. You mentioned it. Reputation being very social when you were in college. Uh, we we'll understand. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin, and it's kind of known for its cheese and beer pretzels. <laughs> <laughs> and then, for, for good reason, by the way. <laughs> and then industrial, uh, industrial sales, you mm -hmm. went into that? Yes. Tell us about that path and how it's led to where you are today and how that's you know, assisted you in your thinking mm -hmm. and prepared you to be here today. Well, I actually wanted to, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an architect, and, and I lived in Wisconsin and, and didn't, my, had a very middle-class family and, and really needed to go to the state school. And I was not an Ivy Leaguer. <laughs> I couldn't have gotten in anyway. But, uh, um, you know, the, the, the University of Wisconsin didn't really have an architecture school, and so I didn't really know the difference between architecture and engineering, so I just went into engineering because it was kind of the same thing to me as an 18-year-old. And, um, and uh, you know, I learned, and I was social. I joined the good fraternity on campus, and, um, which, you know, now has been, I think now technically has uh, been either kicked off campus or maybe shut down in its entirety. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, the thing that I learned about engineering was that when you went to class uh, and, and the professor would tell you something, that was never what was going to be on the test. You know, in engineering, it's like about problem solving. So they would teach you to, to a problem, and then I was smart enough to realize, okay, that never is going to be on the test. What was the underlying thing the guy was trying, or the woman was trying to teach us? And, and then that's what will be on the test. And so I kind of fast forwarded to 
the end, which meant I didn't really have to study because none of the stuff that was in the book would ever be on the test. It would be the problem that you had to solve. And I just got into this mindset of going to the end state, which engineers kind of do anyway. And, I'm, and I had this love of architecture, and, and building a company is a lot like um, building a house, honestly. And, and uh, um, I just sort of, I think, mentally was equipped for it. There, there's, a, there's a Saarinen, who was an ar architect who did a lot of mid-century modern furniture, you may know, had a, had a saying, which I really think a lot about, which is, you know, always design a chair to fit in a room, and always design a room to fit in a house, and always design a house to fit in the environment and always de de design the environment to be a part of a city. In other words, when you're designing a chair, you know, you're, you're part of a city. You go right to the end state. And, um, and that kind of thinking has served me well because when you're running a company and starting a startup, you just don't know what's going to come at you. And you better be sort of prepared to, to, to not focus on that immediate detail, but think, where, where am I trying to get to? And I got to get to this end state. Uh, and everything along the way is just kind of details. Mm -hmm. And I passed, and I, I, you know, I, I got a diploma. <laughs> <laughs> and you now they're you. asking me for money, by the yes, way. Right. <laughs> Getting lost. So I thought it was a state school. I came here because they didn't need it any, <laughs> yeah. anyway. <laughs> Getting lost, right? Is it? Uh, um, well, on those skills and the skills development as you develop technology companies, um, right now when the companies are thinking about what they're going to do, how they're going to grow, right. how they're going to run their business today, it's all driven by talent. Right. And how, so you've grown your business here in Georgia, here in Atlanta. How have you found finding the right kind of talent uh, so that you can be able to build that, that company here and other companies? Well, in tech, as many of you know, there's basically a zero percent unemployment rate. I mean, if you're a good tech engineer, you, you can sort of pick where you want to go and what you want to do. And um, so that's the market that we're recruiting in. And, um, and you know, I'm fortunate, uh, Gary Cohn, who, who's, who was the president of Goldman Sachs, who's now the, the uh, President Trump's advisor that you may know of, from, um, called me up when we first started the company and said, we can't hire anybody in New York for tech. This is in the dot-com era. Uh, the first dot-com era, and um, the, uh, he said, if you have people that, that don't want to live in Atlanta, send them up here. Um, and oddly, I never called Gary because I never found anyone that didn't want to live in Atlanta. Yeah. And I found a lot of people that didn't want to live in New York. And, um, <laughs> and it, Atlanta is really, and it was not, I was not from Atlanta. I bought this failing company here, when, and I was living in Beverly Hills, for crying out loud, and I had a BMW. And, um, I just thought, you know, I've hit the top of the food chain. And uh, um, I came out here thinking it was going to be hound dogs and pickup trucks. And, and, uh, um, and that's what you found? <laughs> no, what's amazing is on the surface, you can see that kind of thing. And I'm being a bit facetious, but yeah. the diversity here is amazing. Really? And one of the things we sell people who we try to actively recruit um, to Georgia is, is the different lifestyles. You can live downtown and, and have a very citified life and, 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 and ride Marta. You can live out you know, with a hound dog and a pickup truck and, uh, and have a horse farm and still make it into this area here. And, and, and there are lots of different pockets of ethnicity around, and lots of, um, you know, we bring people from all around the world because we're, we're, we're literally looking for the best and, um, and it's amazing how easy it is to assimilate here. And I, I don't know that that's obvious to people. I mean, um, uh, Glenn mentioned Hala and, and the Metro Chamber, and obviously, Larry, for a long period in your career, you were helping with that. And part, that's part of the message that we're trying to get out um, when we go to South by Southwest or what have you. We try to talk about, you know, you probably don't really know what we have here because it's, it's, it's something that is slightly below the surface that, that Atlanta has never been celebrated for, but it is there. So especially in areas like, say, FinTech, where you've either emerged or emerging to be the FinTech capital of the world, where do you think, are we there yet? Well, I mean, you know, we run the New York Stock Exchange from here, for Christ's sake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good sign, right? <laughs> Pretty good <Yeah>. sign. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, you know, when people think of uh, fintech here, they t you know, we have these great payment processing infrastructure, and obviously healthcare too, you know, uh, with, with uh, healthcare technology. Um, and, and those are kind of the centers. People don't think of ICE that much because we, maybe because we're outside the perimeter, as, as Tom Noonan said, we're, we're just across the street here. Um, but, um, um, you know, we really are one of the dominant uh, fintech players when you think of true financial technology being, being stocks and bonds and, and, and derivatives and commodities. You mentioned in the video that you, whenever you um, made your first acquisition, you were really thinking about it from a customer. Right. But over the career, you've really um, started to acquire several you know, floor trading exchanges. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've converted them into this electronic platform that you developed. Right. So talk a little bit more, tell us a little bit more about how that transition has happened and then the transition of getting other people on the similar platform. Yeah, I, you know, one thing that I've learned, I'm, I'm older than most of you guys here, so I've, I've you know, uh, been through a number of different uh, life experiences as an entrepreneur. And uh, one thing I've learned is that people hate change. Uh, and I know you, you're saying, well, I don't hate change. In fact, you know, on my next vacation, I'm going to take a backpack and I'm going to walk across India. Um, but I really, I swear, I, I don't think, uh, even even those that are the most adventurous, we really don't like change. Like we really want to go home tonight, and and go into the bedroom that you left this morning and sleep there. You know, if that thing gets hit by a tornado and is gone, you you don't say, well, that's uh, there's another opportunity for me to find a place to sleep. <laughs> I mean, we kind of we're in our routines and we and we don't like change. And so um, uh, there's opportunity if you can be ahead of people. Um, if you can anticipate where change goes. I, I, I really, I've read a lot about Steve Jobs and, 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 and I think he was a, kind of a, a, honestly a jerk to work for, but he was a visionary in that he said, wouldn't it be cool to carry all your music around in your pocket? Um, and pe customers weren't saying to him, you know what I could really use is a device where I could put my music in my pocket. Um, you know, he, he sort of anticipated, hey, vinyl is going to not be, or, or cassette tapes uh, aren't going to be where it's at, and, and, and music's going to go digital. And so there are these moments in time when, if, if you're thinking far enough ahead, you can, you can sort of beat the masses, but you can't be too far ahead because people don't, they're not going to change easily. And, um, and so what I'm saying to you is we kind of found the timing um, right and, uh, and did that. And it, wasn't, it didn't all happen in one year, but we, we kind of stitched the acquisitions together at a moment in time where we were just a little bit ahead of where people were going to be. And, um, uh, and usually there, you know, when we all change is, is honestly when, you know, the first rule, uh, Isaac Newton, here's me as an engineer, Isaac Newton said, uh, object in motion stays in motion at the same uh, direction and velocity unless it's acted on by a force. And uh, I always think about, okay, that means everything's going to stay just what it is until there's acted on by a force. So what is the force? And in my industry, we sit here and think, what is the force? You know, it could be a competitor, it could be a regulatory change, it could be a Lehman collapse, whatever, you know. But you want to be positioned for, you want to kind of anticipate the force and then be positioned for it. And, and, um, and that's to a large degree been the key to uh, our success, sort of, you know, taken back, say it easier, it's right place, right time. But we, we, we anticipated where we wanted to be. And, um, and so, as you mentioned, we have 12 exchanges. I've, ha I've actually had more than that. We spun out uh, the French, the Dutch, the uh, Belgian, and Portuguese stock exchanges two years ago. Um, but, you know, we own the, not only the New York Stock Exchange, but the old American Stock Exchange, the Pacific Stock Exchange, the Cincinnati Stock Exchange, for those that are my age that remember that we used to have a lot of regional exchanges, and, um, and then set the world's price of oil. After the Lehman collapse, uh, uh, all the banks were, were having problems funding, and, and people said, you know, we got to get the toxic assets off the books of the banks. So we set up a company to take the toxic assets of the banks, thinking that was a good idea, by the way, thinking they would pay us, and they <laughs> did. And we took $60 trillion worth of credit default swaps off the books of the banks, and none of us knew what a credit default swap was, had ever even heard of the damn things, just knew that it brought down the financial system, and I'll bet you could make money if you figured out how to deal with them, uh, and we have. And so, uh, and so it's kind of you know, just paying attention to your environment and being right place, right time. How many exchanges were part of the New York Stock Exchange when you 
McGuire? There, uh, there are essentially six today. I think the video said we own 11 exchanges. We've bought another one since I made that video. <laughs> so we have uh, 12, but six of them basically are equity and equity options exchanges um, for the United States. So with the eye on the future, so this is uh, the undercurrent of what's going on today with digital currencies and your, and your uh, crystal ball. Where is it going? Where is digital currency, blockchain? What's your perspective and point of view on that today? Um, we, well, we were an early investor in a, in a blockchain um, exchange called Coinbase, which is the largest blockchain exchange now in, in the United States and is a very legitimate business. And we did that. We normally don't invest in lots of startups, but we do where we think we can where we can be helpful and where, or they can be helpful to us. And in this case, these really smart guys what were kind of ahead of the curve on blockchain. We decided to put money into them in order to really have them help educate us what was going on. And so um, we also created a, a, the first Bitcoin index, which is a New York Stock Exchange index. Um, so I'm, I'm pro, but I don't actually think that's where it's going to go. Um, I think, you know, kind of using my logic of being one step ahead. Uh, I do think that, that um, blockchain and distributed ledger technology is actually going to manifest itself in the financial services industry um, as opposed to any other thing. And, then, and part of it is that there are a lot of friction costs in financial services that are there that could be taken out by the right technology. And it doesn't necessarily have to be blockchain or distributed ledger. But that's the thing everybody's talking about now. And if you get enough people talking about something and investing in it and looking at it, it's amazing how you know, that may be the platform on which this happens, even though you could pick other platforms. And so and I'm not sure it's actually going to be the blockchain as much as, if you guys follow this stuff, as, as much as it is the distributed ledger. Uh, when I've talked to, uh, I won't say who, but one, a, a bank CEO, one of the largest banks in the world, and they have a tremendous amount of friction moving money inside the bank between the bank and their branches. And then at the end of the day, moving money back into the, into the uh, holding company. And, um, and, and it's, it's amazing how expensive it is for them to do an internal wire transfer. So I think there are possibilities of of creating technology, either distributed ledger or blockchain or some ver variation thereof, that people can just use internally that don't really require the rest of the world to adopt it. And, uh, and I think we're going to see some of that, some of these use cases coming out of financial services. So internal innovation first within people's own walls and then... Yeah, the thing, the thing about... Um, the thing about Bitcoin is, you know, it's as good as, as everybody else on the network that uses it. Um, you know, if, you're, if your grocery store isn't going to accept Bitcoin, it doesn't matter how rich you are in terms of Bitcoin if you can't spend it. And so, um, and so you could see, and so, you know, it, it, it gets stronger with every use, user. But uh, I think there'll be some internal uses or some small um, uh, limited uh, groups that, that will use it. Um, for their own use cases that may not ever need to scale in order to be successful. And if you get that, you know how life is, it's likely to frickin' scale. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Great perspective, appreciate that. Um, so here, the Georgia Technology Summit, great heroes that we're celebrating. So Jeff, in your opinion, what has been the most positive technological innovation in the last decade, in your opinion? Hmm. Um, well, so the New York Stock Exchange um, was formed uh, in 1792 um, by the signing of an agreement called the Buttonwood Agreement that we still have on display if you ever come to the exchange. And the Buttonwood Agreement was so named because the New York Stock Exchange um, started on um, the corner of Wall Street and Broad Street where there was a buttonwood tree and everybody agreed to meet under the tree to uh, exchange stocks. So a bit like the Romans agreeing to meet in some square for commerce. And, and you know, my career has been, uh, instead of meeting under a tree, has been meeting online. And uh, what I see really that's happening now is, is that 
the Buttonwood Agreement was codifying a network. The network was everyone agreed to meet at this tree. Um, today, networks form almost instantaneously. And what we have inherited f over 227 years at the New York Stock Exchange um, is something that, you know, that we just took Snap public on the New York Stock Exchange a few weeks ago. And those guys in a couple years created a network that is probably, in terms of scale, similar to what 225 years took uh, for the Stock Exchange. I tell you that because I think it is really the ability to network. Glenn Laurie walked out of here, but he's, he's sitting, <laughs> he runs you know, one of the country's largest networks. It's the ability for a network of people whether it's a social network or whether it's a business network or whether it's a blockchain network, it's the ability for networks to form, and, and it, it's obviously fueled by the fact that we have a computer that we all carry around in our pocket now. But, but it is that interaction of networking. And to the extent, if you look at the great companies, that the valuable companies that we talk about in tech, I will tell you that at the root of them, what these people did is they figured out how to start a network. And I figured out I wasn't smart enough to start a network, so I'll buy the ones that were standing around trees <laughs> and take them digital. <laughs> Last question. I had a very successful man tell me one time that he had learned nothing from his success, only from his failures. So what's your biggest lesson you've ever learned in business? Mm, boy, well, it's a couple because I, I'm, I've been a serial entrepreneur, and so I have a few big failures that, that in my career that I, that guide me. Um, one is that I didn't realize that, um, that business goes through cycles. I mean, I knew that because I went to college, but I didn't really know what a business cycle was. And I didn't, I, today I really have, a, and, I, and I missed some great opportunities because I misread what was going on in the environment. And so when I was thinking ahead, I didn't have this, uh, notion of a business cycle. And um, there are moments in time when it is really easy to start a company, and there are moments in time when the exact same company probably can't be started. And there are moments in time when you gotta hit the gas, and there are moments in time when you better hit the brake. And my company has had, as profits have increased every single year since we started the company, since we took the company public, um, and has grown at an over 20% compound rate. But it wasn't because it just went up, 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 up. It was us feathering the gas, feathering the brake, feathering the gas, feathering the brake, figuring out where to, okay, now's the time, go, 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 stop, 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 stop. And so it's hard to articulate that because, I mean, and there are certainly young people, you know, uh, uh, like Zuckerberg and others that have created great companies um, and gone through a business cycle. But, but it's hard as a, as a young person to fully uh, comprehend how powerful and how uh, both positively and negatively a business cycle is. And unfortunately, we, business cycles are a fact of business. And, um, and I would just say that to you. By the way, it's not intuitive, but sometimes the best time to start a company is at the worst time in a business cycle. Um, so it's, it's not always uh, um, you know, uh, linear. But, um, but that, that, and I'm sorry I can't give better advice than that other than, than if, if you, don't, don't think that the world is going on a straight trajectory. It's going and fits and starts. Jeff Brecker, congratulations on being inducted into the 2017 Technology Hall of Fame. Thank you for all your leadership that you, and all you do for this community. Right. Well, congratulations. Thank you, thank you Dave. Good job. Thank, thank you. you. I'm going to leave that. Yeah. Please welcome back to the stage John Trainer, Chairman of the Board for the Technology Association of Georgia. All right. So I come to these things and I'm involved with them to learn. Um, I think we learned a lot uh, just then. I know I did. I'm going to sum up my learnings. I need to start focusing on having a secure, network-oriented, IoT-based, distributed ledger system to fund my personal farm and my robotic jazz habits. So everybody good with that? 
We learn. I think we had a wonderful day today. I learned a great deal. Um, I mentally rank every GTS that I've been to, uh, and I will, I will say this is uh, absolutely one of my favorite, uh, better than the two that I chaired. So congratulations to, uh, to Robert uh, Hendrickson for chairing a phenomenal event. Let's give him a round of applause. I wanna make sure that we thank our sponsors. Um, it's important uh, that, that they do what they do so that we can all come here together and learn and be motivated. I'm gonna walk through them uh, and uh, please stand as I say the name of your company uh, and then we'll applaud for all of them at the end. And I can't wait to see my awesome, good looking contingency when I say the first name. So stand up, Aaron's, Alpharetta Technology Commission, no clapping yet, Applied Resource Group, ATDC, Georgia Tech, Comcast Business, Cumberland Group, Georgia Department of Labor, McKesson, S2 IT Group, Sun Technologies, ServiceNow, and Tintry. Let's give them all a round of applause. All right, y'all sit down, and then we'll all go back to work, and you've got to add six more hours onto the day because you've spent time here. Uh, I want to thank also our silver uh, and bronze VIP reception and break sponsors that are listed uh, in the program, and obviously our platinum sponsors for everything they've done. Uh, I also want to thank our top 40 chair. Uh, I think we had phenomenal innovators uh, this year. So I want to thank Dennis Zakis and John Wilson. It was awesome what they did. Good job. And now after a long day where many of you arrived uh, 6 to 6.30 in the morning, uh, I'm happy to say that we're all done and uh, head out and go innovate. Thank you.